We began reading from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 a few weeks ago, and it begins with the Beatitudes. And if you, unless you try to cultivate the attitude of the Beatitudes, practicing the rest of the sermon is really impossible. And so if you cannot accept, <clears throat> blessed are the persecuted, then this gospel today will just make no sense. So we come to the culmination of the Sermon on the Mount, and remember last week Jesus told us, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And he equates anger with murder, lust with adultery. He's telling us to be a person of unquestioned integrity. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Everything else is from the evil one. And then today there's this, love your enemies, pray for your persecutors. Again, Jesus is the only person who ever preached this. And I guess the question is why? Well, he wants to disarm the violence that affects this world and in particularly our interpersonal relationships. Way at the beginning of the sermon, Jesus said, let your righteousness surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. In other words, they, they were fulfilling the law. But Jesus wants his followers to be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. So if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you want to claim the name Christian, well, this is part of it. Jesus wants us to go beyond an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. As the saying goes, what goes around comes around. At some point, those who are powerless will be in a position of power. And so what will you do when you finally have power over your enemy? How will you act? What will you do when your enemy is in your grasp? Will it be an eye for an eye or something even worse? Or will it be to act as your Father in heaven does? And we can't be abstract here. We shouldn't think about the enemy as someone out there. It's the North Koreans, it's the Russians, it's Al-Qaeda, it's whoever. No, think of someone who has harmed you personally, someone who has taken life from you, someone who, whose behavior has, has left a scar in your life. Maybe the person who took your spouse from you, maybe the ex-spouse who poisoned your relationship with your children, maybe the person who falsely accused you and you lost your job or didn't get that promotion, maybe the person who sued you falsely, person who abused you when you were a child. That's the enemy that Jesus is talking about. And that's the person he wants you to love. But of course, how and why? Well, I think it's helpful if we look at another biblical example of someone who had his enemies in his grasp and how he acted and what he did. It's one of my favorite stories of the Bible. It's the story of Joseph, Joseph the patriarch. And you remember, God had promised Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. And things went slowly at first. He finally has his son Isaac. Isaac has his son Jacob. Jacob has his 12 sons. And finally, the nation is starting to take shape. And Jacob's 11th and 12th sons were Joseph and Benjamin. And they were born of his favorite wife, Rachel. He had two wives and he had several concubines. And Rachel died in childbirth with Benjamin. So Jacob doted on Joseph and he favored him, which caused a lot of resentment among his siblings. And here's a really good lesson, especially for men. Do not have a favorite wife because it will cause lots of family dysfunction. <laughs> Love them all the same, guys. Now you're familiar with the story. One day, Jacob talks, tells Joseph, who is 17 years old, to go check on his brothers who were tending the flock. And I'm sure Joseph didn't want to do that because his brothers were always forever mocking him, picking on him. But he goes, and his brothers see him coming. And they say, oh, here he comes. We're sick and tired of him. So let's kill him and be done with it. So Jesus really was correct. Anger can lead to murder, and often does. Then we see the most bizarre thing. They throw Joseph in a cistern, and then they sit down and they eat lunch. I mean, how disconnected do you have to be? 
But then they see a caravan of Ishmaelites and all of a sudden they have a wave of compassion wash over them and they say, well, let's not kill him. I mean, after all, he is our, our brother. And the others agree and they chime in, yes, he is our flesh and blood. So they sold him into the slave trade. Now here's 17-year-old Joseph sitting in the cistern, fearing for his life at the hands of his brothers. And then he is sold into slavery. All of a sudden, he is with people he doesn't know, speaking a language he doesn't understand. And they take him to Egypt, where they put him on the auction block. He's shackled, he's naked. His people look over him, they bid for him. Really, it's the ultimate humiliation, going from being your, your father's favorite to a slave. And he's purchased, as remember, by Potiphar, who was a powerful manager in Egypt for the Pharaoh. But here, Joseph doesn't give up. He <clears throat> shows his skills, and he gets in, put in charge of all of Potiphar's household and his businesses. Things get a little uncomfortable, <clears throat> but he still continues to decide he wants to do his best despite the circumstance. Then one day, Potiphar's wife said to him, you slave boy, you will sleep with me tonight. It wasn't a request, it was a command of a master to a slave. Now Joseph says, no, how could I betray Potiphar? How could I sin against God? You see, even through all the hardship, Joseph believed that God was still with him. Potiphar's wife, of course, continues to insist and Joseph continues to refuse. Finally, she accuses Joseph of rape. And Potiphar does, well, the only thing he could, he threw Joseph in jail. So once again, Joseph is done in by jealousy and anger, and he spends years in jail. But even there, he decides to, to make the best of it, become the best prisoner he possibly can, and he becomes the warden's chief assistant. Now, eventually, Pharaoh gets in a tizzy, and he sends his butcher and baker, but not his candlestick maker, to jail. <laughs> and they're de devastated. You know, working in Pharaoh's palace was a cushy and comfortable job, and now they were sitting in a jail cell. And while there, they had a dream that really shatters them. But they couldn't figure out what it meant. So Joseph told them that he could interpret their dream but only if they would remember him later on. And so he tells the butcher his dream means that his days of confinement are coming to an end and he will be back once again in Pharaoh's service. And he tells the baker his dream means too that his days of confinement will come to an end soon. The papers have been signed for his execution. Then a few days later, the baker is executed. Now the butcher gets out, but he doesn't remember Joseph, and he, several years go by, and once again, Joseph is left alone. Then the Pharaoh had a really disturbing series of dreams, and he asked his magicians and soothsayers what the meaning of the dreams were, but they failed to understand. Now finally, the butcher remembers Joseph, and he tells Pharaoh, remember that time we had a little bit of a disagreement and you kind of threw me in prison? Well, there's a guy in that jail who can interpret your dreams. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph. Joseph gets all cleaned up. He no longer smells like prison. And he stands before the most powerful man in Egypt. And he tells him what his dreams meant. He says, Pharaoh, your dreams mean seven years of incredible bounty, a high, high GDP. But then after seven years, famine and hardship. Now, Joseph doesn't just stop there. He pushes, and he thought this is his moment to win favor with Pharaoh. And he tells him, what you need to do, since you will have seven years of bumper crops, is to designate centers in your cities for storing the grain, build more silos, and then tax the grain at 20%. Then when the famine comes, you will sell the grain, not give it away, and in that way, you will become extremely rich and powerful. Now, of course, Pharaoh <clears throat> loves the plan. And he says to Joseph, 
Joseph says to Pharaoh, well, you know, Pharaoh, you'll need someone to manage all this. So, yeah, Pharaoh appoints Joseph, who will be put in charge of all the grain, enriching Pharaoh and having, of course, power over the entire nation. And the famine eventually did come, and it spread way beyond Egypt to the land where Joseph's family lived. And so Jacob, Joseph's father, says to his sons, we're starving here, and I've heard there is plenty of grain in Egypt. Go down there and get some food. So off they go, and they come hat in hand, and unbeknownst to them, they have to ask Joseph, their brother, the brother they sold into slavery for help. Now, they don't know it's Joseph, and you know why they don't recognize Joseph? This is a really bad joke, because he walked like an Egyptian. <laughs> I better take that out for the next mess. Now, Joseph recognizes them, but he says to them, I will help you, but go home and bring back your father. Now, they're a bit confused, but they figure they have no choice, so they do so. And then we know the famous scene when Joseph can't contain himself and he orders all his staff to leave, and he simply looks at his brothers and said, I am Joseph, your brother. Now, the brothers were speechless, and at that moment, their bowels were fully released, I'm sure. <laughs> and here's the moment that really makes our point. Joseph had his enemies in his grasp, and they knew it. And they were probably thinking they would be executed in the next few minutes. But at that moment, Joseph remembered all they did to him, all they took from him, all the injustices he suffered since. What do you do when you got the power and your words can determine the destruction of your enemy? What happens when you go, what goes around finally does come around? What happens when you have the power to determine the destiny of your enemy? And the answer to that question really depends on what you did with your bitterness, with your anger. And if you're still dragging it around when this happens, you will be like the people who you don't like. And so Joseph's brothers are terrified in his presence and they were sure that he would do to them what they did to him. But they need not fear because Joseph had lived as if God were, was with him during his absence and he kept his bitterness at bay. And here's what's really amazing. And Joseph couldn't have known it back when it all started to unravel that God's plan for the ages would hang on his very word. The plan that God had given to Abraham to make of him a great nation, and from that nation God would introduce the Savior of the world, and through whom God would do for the world exactly what Joseph did for his brothers, forgive them, because he didn't carry around a bag of bitterness and a sack of anger, even though he had every reason in the world to do so. And so Joseph asked the question when his brothers beg for mercy, and it's a question you will have to answer at some point in your life. Joseph asked, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? You will never experience the good that comes from the bad unless you realize God was with you during the bad. And refuse to play God when things come around. And so Joseph's brothers, Joseph tells his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God was still, God had intended things for good to accomplish the saving of many lives. And here's the thing. One day you may have the power of the person who harmed you, who abused you, who stole your childhood, who took away your children. When it comes around, you will remember what they did to you. And in that moment, Jesus invites you to remember who was with you, and in that moment, you will have a decision to make. What will you do when you have the power to determine the destiny of your enemy? When your words determine the destiny of your enemy, will you pay them back, or will you use the words to pave the way forward? Your decision will not be determined then, but by what you did between now and then. 
And I hope you will take care from the one who gave life to you, not the one who took life from you. So follow Jesus' teaching. Pray for your persecutors now so that when what goes around comes around, you'll be able to love your enemies. And then you will be like your Father in heaven and you will be free.